Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I'm Sandy Rosenthal, host of Beat the Big Guys, and I am really, really excited about my guest today. His name is Mr. Aaron Mayer. Hello, Mr. Mayer. How are you? Good evening, Sandy. How are you doing? I am wonderful. Thank you. So Mr. Mayer is a resident of Schenectady, New York. He founded the H. Hayward Burns Environmental Education Center and the Arbor Hill Environmental Justice Corporation. Mr. Mayer served as the 57th president of the Sierra Club. Mr. Mayer is an expert, intersectional public speaker on environmental policy, land use, brownfield, diversity, equity, inclusion, organizational culture change, voting rights, and reapportionment. Mr. Mayer is one of several early environmental justice movement pioneers and founders. And I can't wait to, to talk more about those early things that you did. So, so Mr. Mayor, um, again, I'm so excited to have you with us today. And I understand that in the 1980s, your first rodeo that you were involved in was a fight to shut down a solid waste incinerator in Albany. Uh, would you like to talk a little bit about that um, to our well, listeners? I guess the rodeo is a Texas thing, uh, but uh, uh, but but specifically, I guess the good fight or dust up was absolutely was the Answers Incinerator. Answers stands for the Albany, New York State Waste to Energy Recovery System. And in the 1970s, this was on the planning board. Uh, this was deemed to be state of the art. State of the art by that means uh, a technology that was going to provide a good public benefit while minimizing risk at the same time be profitable for local government. So what the great idea was and the technology was that they're gonna burn garbage to create energy and that energy would be then supplied to the New York state capital complex. Everything from the governor's mansion, the uh, uh, state Supreme court, the legislative office buildings, um, the actual capital governing apparatus as well as a host of state government agencies. Uh, and to do so uh, by burning garbage, you would basically not be paying for, you know, dirty fossil fuel costs. And with the state of the art technology was that there's going to have a very tall smokestack that would carry the burned incinerator dust or, or, or smoke aloft or up and over and carry it away from the community. So there would not be any environmental harm or risk to the community. Now, a lot of people who heard this idea of burning garbage for energy uh, felt that that was too good to be true and they sought more reassurances. And so the community in its public comment asked for more comment, but also they asked openly for benefits. So, well, if we're gonna take this garbage and center, what does it mean for us? Well, part of selling this project, like any project was to minimize the risk and promote benefits, whether they're real or imagined uh, to communities, especially a low income community that had high needs and high demands. And so when you have a low income community, the, the biggest uh, deception or what I call bait and switch that they always choose is the word job. Now, jobs are often, you know, when you tell a poor person that they can get a job, the implication is that there will be an opportunity, a one to one opportunity for po folks in high income needs who are in need of jobs or able body can work, that they would somehow be able to be employed at this particular facility that, you know, well, okay, you got an incinerator, but hey, you got a job too. But the reality of it is, is that uh, when you get a state job, there's something called a civil service and you gotta get an exam and these things are given statewide. If you pass the exam, doesn't mean that you're automatically guaranteed a job at that place or locality. So even the euphemism or term that it was a hook to sell this to the poor community uh, it was really a throwaway term and a throwaway concept. But the main thing was to get public comment, to meet the regulatory frame of public comment, to get the support so they can pass this bill, that they can get the legislation to support and create this incinerator. And then once it is a matter of fact and reality, then it becomes impossible to get rid of it because now you've got the approvals. And the main hurdle that they had to beat down was this poor, uh, mostly predominantly African-American community which happened to be the poorest community in upstate New York. The city of Albany is the capital. The capital of the state of New York is about the midway point between Montreal, Canada, and New York City. Uh, so, you know, we're about uh, uh, three hours north of New York City. 
uh, at the intersection of the Mohawk Rivers and the uh, Hudson River, so to give people a geographical framework. Um, and where the Mohawk River comes and meets the Hudson, there's like big valleys. And so uh, the hollow, uh, which the Patroon flows through that actually geograph uh, ge 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 the geography that created the hollow uh, flows right to the Hudson River. So uh, Arbor Hill is on a hill and Capitol Hill is on the hill and then the with Sheridan Hollow where they built this plant. So one of the things that you learn about technology when they designed this plant and the stack and etc., they assumed in the model and design that sold it that it's in a flat plane and that this thing you know is XYZ height and the municipality at a flat plane will carry it along. Well if you're in a hollow think about having a hat and then putting the plant down inside the hat. And the hills are the things, are, are the brim uh, that are up on the top. So my home is on Arbor Hill on the north, Capitol Hill is to the south. And one of the things you know about weather, especially in the Northeast, wind is predominantly out of the north or predominantly at the south, this north-south flow. And the Hudson River Valley is a valley. So this is big north-south flow. So, so suffice it to say, the prevailing wind, uh, uh, or as they would say, uh, your northerly winds, or basically winds at the south blowing north, uh, which then would carry the, you know, uh, the smoke over Arbor Hill. You know, this is the winter time you need heat, you know, uh, so they crank up and burn extra garbage and it carries it aloft over Arbor Hill. And then sometimes you'll want, you know, have those, uh, you know, the southerly winds during the summer, which also brings up heat from the south. Um, you know, which again, you need more air conditioning and you can burn more garbage and it carries it over Arbor Hill. Well, one of the things with that technology is that uh, in burning garbage in a hollow, my house is at grade at the top of the brim. So we actually, the top of the stack is at the grade of uh, the hills or any of the community that's on the hill. So the smoke did not carry it aloft, it carried it at street level. And so what ended up happening, uh, it carried the smoke from this incinerator ash uh, that by the way, it burned garbage for an eight county region in upstate New York. So it burned it for almost the entire capital district of almost, almost a million people. Uh, but the negative amenity, the smoke and the, the trash was burned in that community. So uh, my home was right in the prevailing wind path uh, of it. It's between, my house is between a middle school and an elementary school. And so that smoke enveloped both the elementary school, the community in between, and the middle school. And I lived on a nature preserve called Tivoli Park Nature Preserve. And it just the deposition also fell out into the nature preserve as well. The long and short of it is my children, along with thousands of other children, ended up with uh, what they call environmental asthma. And countless hundreds of other children were coming up with unelevated blood lead levels. And so naturally they attributed the lead levels to the aging housing stock. There's a lot of 19th century housing stock. Um, and uh, so they blamed the housing stock as the source of the lead, but they could not explain away the asthma cause. And, uh, and after uh, you know, a lot of work, and I'm a retired epidemiologist, epidemiologist from the state of New York, uh, I did a lot of uh, health, public health mapping for the state of New York. You get, you go out and you map these things. And so I created a control group and a control sample. So I looked at, you know, a lot of the housing stock within the city. And one would expect that the cases of lead poisoning or elevated lead poisoning would be equivalent for not only my residential area, but for all other areas, all things being equal, since a lot of the housing stock was in the 19th century. So after controlling for the age of housing within uh, my neighborhood in my community and then looking at it relative to the whole city, one of the things I found was that the housing within or people who were residents within the prevailing plume of the incinerator, that's where the elevated blood lead level cases were. But the same 19th century housing that was outside of the plume area were statistically significantly lower. So there was something happening with lead within the prevailing wind pattern that you could not explain by aging housing stock alone. Now they try to also say, well, it might be from leaded fuel. I go, well, we have, we've banned lead and gasoline for some time. They're saying, well, it may be in the soil. 
But the fact of the matter is, is that Albany being one of the oldest cities in the country, uh, you could not just merely write it off on the standard pat arguments. But also the other benefit was that, you know, I chose to live in the Arbor Hill community. I chose to raise my daughters in an African American community. Um, and I could have definitely moved or lived in the suburbs, but this is part of, you know, my long uh, intergenerational uh, uh, history of my father being, you know, a, a person who was a labor organizer, NAACP, and always told, you know, reminded us of giving back. You do well, you got to give back to the community. So one level of giving back was not only acculturating my daughters, but also being part of the community. And this was one of the historic and oldest black communities uh, in the country. And it was the source of, uh, 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 you know, of the Underground Railroad. When you think of that, the Myers home, which was the grand central of the underground. People think about Harriet Tubman, but they don't realize that it was founded right here in the city of Albany, right in Arbor Hill. And uh, so, you know, it has a deep, rich history that I wanted my daughters to be near uh, and, and absorb. But in pursuing the history and the pursuing, you know, being in a community and culture that I want to raise my children, now you have to deal with an environmental risk. And that made them uniquely at risk, uh, you know, to be exposed to this incinerator. And one of the reasons why the community was chosen by the state when they cited it, it was the path of least resistance, uh, meaning that a lot of the other communities did not want a waste of energy incinerator, regardless of whatever the incentives were. But they, most of the middle class folks, you could not sell them on the notion of jobs. They knew that you had to get civil service, so the job offer was meaningless, as well as some of the other inducements incentives that you could not pull on any other community that was a little bit more sophisticated or educated. But suffice it to say, when I came, I did not know about the history of the incinerator. I was not here during the siting process. I came just shortly after it was in full operation. And so when I bought my home thinking I got myself a great land deal that was on a nature preserve because I wanted to be near flora and fauna, um, you know, as I said, the Lord put me in the right place uh, with my right skills at the right time to serve people of, of high need. And he, you know, again, it, it was that anointing by, you know, the by the battle of, of my children, their health being tested, that really pulled me in and my skill set to help the community. So it was that experience, my skill set, that then, as I said, start to mobilize and organize the community. And so, and to do that, you know, I knew that being a smart uh, public health professional in the health department was not enough. Uh, my father always said, if you're going to take on a big institution and organization, you must scale up to be an institution. That's why you become a member in the NAACP or the Urban League or any civil rights or, or movement organization to be, get out members, to organize, to mobilize, to take on that big threat and risk. And when you're going to take on the state of New York, uh, which has, the like any government, they have the bottomless pockets of taxpayers that they can always turn to to push back any litigation or challenge. Mm -hmm. You got yourself a fight on your hands. So you have to really find those institutions that could help. So I turned to the Sierra Club amongst many environmental organizations. And I traveled all the way from Albany to New York City at the invitation of uh, a Sierra Club member to make my case in the battle uh, uh, against, you know, solid waste and solid waste incineration because of the health consequences and the impact it had on not only on my children, but the entire community. And so upon going to the Sierra Club and seeking their help, and at that time they had the garbage barge, the famous garbage barge from when they shut down uh, landfills in New York City, they could not even, New York City could not export its garbage. It actually, were, they were shipping the garbage from, uh, uh, from New York to the South. And then once the residents of the South and North Carolina and, and Georgia got wind of what they were trying to ship to the South. And I think Louisiana was also one of the states that were slated to take the New York State garbage. They, when they got wind of the fed it, uh, garbage and the rats that were on the barge. Nobody wanted it, but that's the backdrop of the era of the time when the real solid waste ar argument was a real big issue. But the long and short of it is that it was known and that the Sierra Club was one of the big players in fighting against solid waste incineration and, and re pushing recycling, etc. So I figured it'd be a home run. So suffice it to say upon me showing up, making the case and making the case in Peel on environmental grounds, and that this is something that is a major uh, national uh, 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 action area for the Sierra Club. I felt that you know their their allyship and their assistance 
would in some way be forthcoming, and at least it will be able to help us. So suffice it to say, when I get there, I'm, I'm, I'm brought into the room. Now I'm six foot seven. I'm a big guy. And, um, you know, at that time I was a little bit stockier. I want to point out to our listeners that, that you don't have to be six foot seven to take on the, be, the, uh, the big guys in your community. I'm, I'm five, four and uh, under a hundred, 110 pounds, but, but, but it, 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 it doesn't hurt to be six, seven, but, but go on. <laughs> that's, 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 that's true. But I figured when I walked into the room, my, by the way, my, my wife is about, is about your size, you know, so. <laughs> You know, you know, remember the band of my boyfriend's back? Well, <laughs> well, anyway, uh, but um, but long and short is I walked in the room and, and it's a room in midtown Manhattan. Uh, and for New York City, you have to understand how odd this was, because New York City at that time was about 65 percent people of color, black, Hispanic and white and Asian. And so it's a very diverse city. So I go to an organizational meeting of an organization that is serving the environmental movement, the Sierra Club. And I figured it's going to go, be going into a diverse It was almost all white, um, with the exception of one woman, uh, Deling Wong, who was Asian. Huh. But the long and short of it is when I walked through the door, everybody stopped talking right away. And a huge hush went over, and all the heads immediately turned. I go, oh, I, I'm, I'm a big guy. So it must have like, oh, you know, that's, this is something we don't see a big giant walk into the room. <laughs> But long and short, I give my presentation, and uh, and it was in the Q and A. Then I realized, you know, uh, something that was very critical that would absolutely shake me to my core, but also lead to another fight that we had to fight uh, at that particular point in time. Because the question came back to me was not about uh, the incinerator and how many tons and who was, you know, what, you know, technology and who was impacted or the housing communities back where it was situated. The first question that went to me was, did I go to the NAACP? So in seeking help, the fact that I was a person of color, uh, it was the first time that I was ever asked on the point of my activism was not the issue, but my race mattered to the activists that should be concerned about the environment. So it was not that they saw a green or a green issue. They saw a black and white issue. And it made it very crystal clear that my race mattered and that I was the wrong complexion for protection. And uh, I was pretty shocked and I was really taken aback. Um, well, suffice it to say, I was turned down. They declined to assist me. Uh, so not only was I, you know, uh, offended by the terms and how it was treated, but I actually, they even took an affirmative vote not to help us. And that really said something, but, you know, suffice it to say, we had ground to come great work to do. And the people that invited me, they were totally embarrassed. They were shocked. Um, they, you know, they were, you know, upset. The individual who came down with me from Albany, New York, a white gentleman by the name of Roger Gray, he spent the almost three hours driving back apologizing. I said, hey, look, Roger, relax. I said, we don't have time for that. You know, this is like going back to the civil rights movement. You don't get upset because somebody like John Lewis pointed out, hit you or brutalize you. You got work to do. The fight is, continues. Just because somebody, a racist or a bigot or somebody who thinks you're less than equal, stands in your way to trip you up, even if you trip and fall, you get up. And you got the fight to do. The issue is I had to fight for the communities and those babies and those residents, those New Yorkers, those Americans that were being poisoned. And the injustice, regardless of the racism, is what the fight was about. But I also had to now the new dimension of that racism was very much part mm -hmm. of the environmental fight. So not only did we have to fight for environmental protection, but we had to fight the double fight of racism. And at that point in time, this is the mid eighties, uh, you know, while we were fighting and doing this in 87, the battle, uh, a study came out of New York, the toxic waste and race in 1987 by Dr. Charles Lee, Dr. Benjamin Chavis and Bernice Miller Travis, who worked then for the United Church of Christ. And they pioneered the study that showed that that experience that I had just went through, uh, that when it came to the siting of polluting facilities or negative environmental amenities, 
uh, that if you are a person of color, you were more likely to be the point location where these things were located. So your race mattered when they were going to basically put something out there that put you and your health and your environment and the, na the natural world around you where you live at risk. So to protect uh, or, or guarantee or add for the nimbyism when white folks say not in my backyard, but you still needed that facility, whether it's a sewage treatment plant or an energy or waste, whatever plant, what they went to was the poor, the working poor, and even amongst the poor and the working poor, then they stratified by race. And so this study was pioneering and groundbreaking. And to me was like the, 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 the sky, the lid flew off of what I had just experienced. And so uh, we were part of that, that bigger effort. In fact, when you get the toxic waste st race study, you'll see in the state of New York in the capital, like a large dot there, that's so often that's where the answers incinerator was. So they were clocking that in so far as their places and points in which they were citing of negative amenities in that great study. But the long and short of it is, is that armed with that study, I knew that I had now had not only the dimension to fight the city hall and uh, the state government that cited this in my community because it was poor. And now with that study, I can say not only was it poor, but it was poor and black. You would not have cited this anywhere else. And so that was a very, very significant factor. And more importantly, the fact that they did nothing to mitigate, offset, remediate, test, or follow on the, the residents underscored the racial dilemma. Again, this is the state of New York that gave us CERCLA, okay? Love Canal happened in Buffalo. Love Canal was hooker chemical plant. Plant They poisoned the groundwater. They illegally disposed of, 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 of tons of toxic waste. They buried it. And then they built homes on top of it. And uh, Lois Gibbs and a lot of the working class white families rose up and they battled, they won. The state has a model to this day running a public health study of the populations, following the populations that were in Love Canal. But from that came our Superfund and CERCLA laws. But here's a little dirty little secret that you don't know about Love Canal. There's a public housing authority project that was also near Love Canal, also affected. It happened to be bloated with a lot of people of color. And guess, did, guess who did not get the benefits? The people of color that lived in the public housing authority. Wow. And so... So even when you look at the model seminal case of Love Canal, you can actually still see the paradigm that would not be discovered until 1987 by uh, the toxic waste and race, that race matter. Who gets protected? Who, they, who does the state move to protect even after a harm is done? If you're white, you're right, and you're moved into the center and they, get, they pour the resources and the dollars and the aid and assistance comes. But when it's the poor communities of color, you have to fight like hell. But more importantly, I did not know the added dimension that even when you think you have allies and friends in the environmental movement, not too many are forthcoming. It wasn't until later on the fast forward that when the, after the Poor People of Color Summit uh, that we created ultimately what would become the environmental justice movement. And the reason why it was the People of Color Summit, because you recognize poor whites, indigenous Americans also were part of that stratified cohort of those discriminating against and who are at risk for significant environmental harm. But amongst our people of color movement, we rec they also further recognize that if you are black, <laughs> you, you will definitely get the worst end of it. So the solidarity of the movement to make sure all people of color are protected was a critical milestone, number one. But the other critical milestone and strategic point was that poor whites and and indigenous folks and Latinos recognize we must defend a lot of our frontline black communities because they are definitely the first in the fire and the first to be left behind. So it was from those those movements uh, that you I met, you know, eventually come to meet people like Daryl Malik Wiley, my fellow activist allies out of Louisiana, and but from all around the country, I learned for the first time stepping outside that meeting in New York City, that I was not alone. So my milieu, my group was found founded outside of the New York State and founded with the Poor People's uh, Movement that created what would become the environmental justice movement. Dr. Benjamin Chavis coined uh, the term environmental racism uh, and added the movement came the term environmental justice when they were pushing for the environmental justice executive order because a lot of politicians say you say racism, they shut down because again, like we're finding to this day, 
racism, you know, uh, is something that white folks are very much ashamed of, so much to so that they're willing to, to now come up with critical race theory, even though it's not critical, it's not a theory, it's a fact, it's ugly, it has to be dealt with. But again, what happens is, is that they come up, well, I don't want to be held accountable. And the same thing is true when it comes to toxic waste and race. A lot of whites, a lot of the institutions don't want the liability and they don't want to be held accountable. So the long and short of it is, is that being part of that movement, that's where I got a lot of technology and support to begin the fight that we had to fight for our movement. Uh, those allies who did feel ashamed in Albany, New York, uh, and were outraged by how I was treated by the Atlanta chapter, uh, a number of them came to help us and aid us and, ra and raise our first uh, few hundred dollars in our campaign to shut down the incinerator. And it was because of that effort, because that they remembered what happened and they, they were offended, that I, I vowed to them, I said, listen, I appreciate your help. And you know what I'm gonna do for you? I'm gonna take your donation because number one, you don't leave money on the table. And number two, I said, I'm going to, I promise you, once we shut down this incinerator, once we correct this action, which I had no doubt that we would, I told him I would become a member of the Sierra Club and transform the culture so that no other community of color and no more people in need would ever be turned away. And well, so that's I how I ultimately, that's that, how I came to the Sierra Club. And that's mm -hmm. how I came full circle from being, not, as I say, not, not allowed in <laughs> to becoming uh, you know, an activist and pioneer in creating their environmental justice uh, network within the organization, but also becoming its first African-American national president. One of the things I love most about um, this, and thank you so much, that was, uh, I didn't have to do a thing, you did all the work. Usually uh, interviewing people is a lot of hard work and uh, you've just made it so easy for me. But um, and several things you discussed are, are, are worth going back to for a moment. But I do want to point out the entire time, even when you had shocking things happen to you and revelations happen to you and you were caught off guard, you, you didn't sit sit down and, and suck your thumb about it. You kept moving forward because there, there's no time to sit and wonder and scratch your head. You know, why is this happening? You 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 deal with it and move on. And and uh, I can't tell you the number of times that, uh, that it, and I, I know in my work um, with levies.org, uh, I realized we never took a photograph. We were so busy with the work and thinking about what needed to be done tomorrow that so many things and so many times went by when not one single person thought to get a photograph of the work that we did. And, and that's okay. And that's really important. And, and, uh, and keeping your nose to the grindstone and being focused on the issue, because what happened to you, I can see they tried to change the subject on you, right? They, uh, and but that when they asked yeah. you the question about the NAACP, they tried to change the subject, right? Right. They, right. They, right. And to, no, it's, it's, and knock really, you off balance. It's really mm -hmm. Well, That's, I don't think it's tend to knock me off balance as opposed to they saw it as we have limited resources. And if we help these people, then we don't have resources to help ourselves, which is still kind of a selfish argument mm -hmm. because you exist as an environmental activist to protect and enlist all humanity to protect your fellow humans from environmental risk and threat. No matter what, it's not an issue of limited resources. The issue is of what are you helping or are you not? And the right. minute that race comes into the calculus or poverty status comes into the calculus or orientation comes into the calculus, then you're doing injustice and harm to the movement, but more importantly to humanity. And you're doing a bet full betrayal of the cause because right. none of those should matter. You know, right. the issue right. is that here's what we're against Here's what we're out there fighting for, you know, and, and you lean into the issue. And you My lean into the issue. Matter. Right. And another thing that you, you discussed uh, and did a very good job with it is the value of allies. You, you can, no matter how good, good you are, and you're very good, you, you came to this um, with a, a set of skills that set you apart and you recognize that and you came to it with a genuine um, interest is that this is where your family lived but it's not enough. You can't do very much alone. The value of allies can't be understated. And, and almost from the get go, it's important uh, to do just what Mr. Mayor did. I'm I, I, everyone should take note of this. You really need to surround yourself with allies, right? 
That's critical. Uh, you yeah. can't do, critical. in fact, whether it's a local movement, a statewide movement, or a national movement, you know, it's, it's who are my friends and who are my enemies. We already know who our enemies are. We already know who's coming at us and who's doing something to us or stripping away our rights and justice. But who are my friends? And it's not enough to automatically assume that your neighbors are going to be there or other people. In this case, you just figure that environmentalists will be my friends. And, and why are friends important? Because you want to match real friends against real enemies. In this case, enemies in the environment. You figure that en allies in the movement, the environmental movement, would be your natural allies and friends. But when other baggage, the institutional baggage of oppression that is within America, whether it's classism, racism, sexism, homophobia, these are real drags that are also there. And, and as they say, and as deadly as the toxins, because it is those values and norms and assumptions that can prevent people from coming together and linking up to bring about significant transformative change and action. And so we, when we have to work on tearing those things down, because you're Black, because you're gay or because you're a female and have to deal with that baggage. You know, like I said, these are things that also create additional stress, break you down. Uh, you know, you have to fight that extra fight. So they, there are additional stresses and risk on you. They break up marriages, you know, uh, you know, you, you, they, they're alienating and isolating. So we, even when you have what's fragile of your community or the community you have, you figure that allies or natural allies within the movement will also add to your community. You never expect them to take away or tear down your community. And it's important, I want to remind our listeners, um, even if it's a small local community, you have to have allies. It's Absolutely. critical, Absolutely. critical. So um, there's something else you said, which I, um, early on, you pointed out, this all sounded too good to be true. And that's a real flag there. When something sounds too good to be true, it's because it's not true. And, 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 and you should trust Absolutely. your instincts when you hear that, okay? And when you well, we see, it, we see it right now with, Jim, with uh, uh, Senator Manchin you know, in West Virginia, because he talks about his constituents and, and what's bad for his people. And now the terms sound melodious and sounds like he's concerned. But when you look at what he's against, the environmental protections for coal miners and, and health protection for coal miners who are not being supplied with any public health benefits in a significant way from the coal industry. All these are major federal subsidies coming from all of America to help residents in this community. But here we have initiatives that are designed to help the poorest of the poor in this community. But he uses words that sound sweet, but actually sound too good to be true because they're not true. And oftentimes you find whether it's a politician who you think is representing you all the way down to a business person, but you'll find out that not all these interests when it comes to citing things, protecting communities, protecting workers from polluting industries like coal, gas, and oil, you find out these politicians while sounding slick and needing your vote come every November, many times, just like those people who turned their back on me when I first showed up in New York City, you know, are actually causing you harm. You know, and just because you elected them, sometimes you still need to mobilize to make it right, as they would say in the Louisiana. You got to make it right. Absolutely you know? and true. So it's never too late to make it right. And it's, it's never too late, too late to mobilize and come together. Even if your choice goes wrong, you still have the power as a citizen to mobilize, organize, come together, find your neighbors, find your allies, find your real allies to make it right. Absolutely. And then one last thing, I'm going to start with the beginning which was, e even though you touched on why you got into the fight in your own community against the, the, the incinerator right there in your backyard, emitting smoke uh, right at the level of your house. So you, you touched on why you entered that fight. But you and I both know, and I, and I, can, tell, I, I can tell everyone, there's a mountain of reasons to not get involved. There's a range of mountains of reasons to not get involved, but you got involved. So I, I know you had a skill set and I know you had a, a, some really good reasons, but what was the tipping point? What was that moment that made you go, that's it. I'm going to do something. I've got to do something. Do you remember what it was? Of course, Sandy. Okay. The most precious thing I got, they hurt my babies. Oh. And now let me tell you, now let me tell you about, about the mountain I had to go against. Of course, 
a middle class scientist could absolutely pack it, pack up and move. I could, it could have been easy. Okay, this this thing cost my daughter's not only help, but it also cost me a marriage. But my baby's got injured. And let me tell you who was my enemy, who I had to sue. I had to sue the governor of the state of New York. I had to sue my boss. I had to sue my health department that I worked for. I had to go as scientists against scientists against my coworkers and colleagues. So let me put it to you this way. I committed career suicide. So in other words, it was not fear of the economic loss. I could not, and they could not give me back my baby's health. But what I can give to them is the pursuit of justice and the equal protection, the demand the equal protection of the law for not only residents of Arbor Hill, but for all New Yorkers and make them pay and set a statewide and national example. But more importantly to my brothers and sisters listening to this broadcast, don't let your fear of loss of job or favor or connection be the reason why you fail to seek justice. A lot of evil is done under fear. A lot of evil is done under fear. Fear is the biggest motivator and killer of success. But as you would know, from the civil rights movement, human rights movement, the labor rights movement, no matter how much they beat us, club us, stomp us, rising up, it is better to, as I say, it's better to, you know, you know, this is to die standing on my feet than the fall laying down, wallowing and cowering, thinking that I can avoid the pursuit of justice or avoid justice for even myself and my family if I, if I just keep my mouth shut, if I just keep quiet. It's gonna to happen to some other people. No, it's happening to you right now. Your womanhood, your manhood, your childhood, any kind of hood stands in the balance, but you must take a stand, period, full stop. That's why I love my brother, Daryl Malik Wiley. No matter how hard his health may, as I say, his health may fail him, but his heart and his soul has never failed him. And, and he's doing heart pretty and well. His soul has never yeah. failed his people. The uh, our, our mutual friend, uh, Mr. Darrell Malik Wiley, the two of us recently traveled to Lafayette um, to to take a stand uh, to cap those abandoned oil wells uh, with General Russell Honore. So he's he's doing well. And I, I'd like to um, he says hello. And uh, I, I think that you've you've crowned this amazing conversation with this stellar ending that I think I think that's a wrap. And if it's okay with you, I think I'm going go, going to head go ahead and um, sign off with uh with our with our final little spiel. And okay, is that good? Thank you. Okay, pleasure, pleasure so, being here. Okay, well, stay, hang with me for just a, one more moment. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Aaron Mayer, for joining me. And I hope all of you enjoyed this episode. You can follow Mr. Mayer at a d k underscore m a i r. Now, make sure to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast today on all of your favorite platforms. And remember, no matter who you are, you can beat the big guys. Okay, stay with me. I'm going to stop recording. Sure. Just, just one.